Greetings and welcome to the Chemistry 222 lecture for Chapter 12, where we investigate the idea of kinetics, specifically kinetics related to chemistry, of course. But uh, this is a pretty interesting chapter. We're going to start analyzing for how chemists think about the time of a reaction and how long a reaction takes, and more importantly, the factors that make up why a reaction is fast or slow. And that's pretty cool things. Along the way, we'll look at the mechanism of a reaction, which is how the reactions, re the reactants go from part A to part B, which is pretty interesting. Uh, you can also think about this as it's about time to talk about time in chemistry. <laughs> uh, keep my day job. I know my jokes are terrible. But anyway, it's a cool chapter. So let's get into it uh, without further ado. One really important thing, though, that we can use right off the bat when it comes to the study of kinetics is uh, a discussion about what's called the Shroud of Turin. Now, if you haven't heard about this, the Shroud of Turin is reportedly the burial shroud, the cloth they put over a dead body. And in this case, it's the shroud, supposedly, of Jesus. And there's a long controversy as to if this actually is the Shroud of Jesus or not, fake or real. Um, for a long time, it was just rumored to be the Shroud of Jesus. But then uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see some pictures that people took in the, I believe it was the early 1900s. And uh, the regular picture, I believe, was on the left, and they inversed it, they reversed the colors, which they can do in photography, on the right. And this was then supposedly the maybe the actual face of Jesus. Well, uh, scientists came in and did some kinetic studies on the shroud itself. And we're going to talk about how they did this, but they can actually analyze the shroud for different kinds of elements that decay with a predictable rate over time. And they found that there's no way that the shroud is 2,000 or so years old, which it would have to be if it was Jesus. It was more likely about 500 years old. And at the time, they suggested that this, I believe it was a count or something like that in the area, who was kind of known as a practical joker, uh, came by one day with this beloved document that really was the shroud of Jesus and stuff like that, and people took it as religious things. So then for a long time, there was no question in the basic world that, oh, this is a fake. But then some religious scientists came in later and said, well, the people that analyzed the shroud didn't look at the main part of the shroud. They looked at like a side part. And when they looked supposedly at the actual main part of the shroud, uh, then it was old enough that it could be uh, the shroud of Jesus Christ. I don't care which way you fall on that argument. Do you think it's absolutely the right thing? Do you think it is the shroud of Jesus, or do you think it's a bunch of crap? And either way, that's up to you. But what I do want you to do is be able to talk with this more than just an emotional reaction. All right? I want you to talk about it in terms of science. Do you think the science is good? Do you think it's garbage and stuff? And how does that correlate with the supposed historic significance of this item? So anyway, it's kind of a cool thing, but after this lecture, you will be able to talk more, and in a scientific method, mind you, not just uh, blatant emotionalism, about the Shroud of Turin. Chemical kinetics is a really interesting part of science. Um, it's actually more than just chemistry. It's actually science itself. And if you look in the lower right-hand corner, there's kind of a scale. And one side says kinetics, and the other side says thermodynamics. And we'll talk about that here. Um, thermodynamics, which is enthalpy, delta H, and all that kind of stuff. Enthalpy is very useful to tell if a reaction is product or reactant favored. And and more often than not, exothermic reactions are product favored. So if you wanted to know if any given reaction was going to happen, more often than not, if you study the thermodynamics and specifically enthalpy, you can tell if the reaction is exothermic, then it's probably going to happen. On the other hand, if it's endothermic, it won't usually happen. We'll talk more about that in Chem 223, what makes up these thermodynamic arguments. 
However, just because a reaction is going to happen, it doesn't say anything about how fast or how slow the reaction takes. And that's an interesting thing because we as human beings with say, you know, 70 years, whatever, on average life, all right, and also being impatient, if you're like me anyway and stuff, we uh, we tend to need things that are in our time frame in the world of humans, all right? We don't want to have to wait, say, 10 thousand years for reactants to go to products. Thermodynamics is great about telling if a reaction is going to go or not, but it doesn't say how fast or how slow. And this is a real difference now. Uh, Thermodynamics doesn't have any information on time. So kinetics is the study of reaction rates, all right? And a reaction rate is basically a study of the time. And the study of the rates cannot happen unless you think about how the reactants go to the products. And this is called the mechanism. And the mechanism helps us understand why the reaction rates are as they are. And both these things together, reaction rates and mechanism, will help us to understand how long the reaction goes. So again, you have a reaction, it's supposed to go according to thermodynamics, you know, cool, all right, but does it take one year or does it take three milliseconds? Kinetics will help us to understand that part. So kinetics and thermodynamics really are useful tools when it comes to science, and they're both complementary. You need one uh, to answer if the reaction's going to go, and the other one will answer how long it will take to occur, which is also kind of cool. So let's look at a general reaction. Let's talk about little red atoms A turning to little blue atoms B. And you can see down there in those three little jars, which are taken at 20 second intervals, at first you have all red, one mole of red A and no blue B. Then after 20 seconds, you're down to a little bit more than half of a mole of red A, but now you've got almost half of a mole of blue B. And after another 20 seconds or when 40 seconds has elapsed, now you're down to only 0 0.30 moles of A and now you have 0 0.70 moles of B. So I want to make some things that are, uh, state some things which I hope are very clear. Um, in a reaction, the reactants will constantly decrease, like you have less and less red the longer we wait, and the products will constantly appear. So we don't start with any blue B, we get more at 20 seconds, we have a lot more at 40 seconds. That's a general trend when it comes to reactants and products. Reactants disappear with time, all right? And when it comes to reactant rates, we're going to put a negative sign in front of them, all right? We're going to see that both reactants and products, we're going to talk about the change in reactants and products. And if you remember since uh, Chem 221, anytime you have a change with a little delta sign, it's always final minus initial. And because reactants are less uh, as time goes on, final Final minus initial is going to give us a negative sign. So one thing you can do right away, we'll see lots of rates in this chapter. Every time you see a negative rate, it'll be a reactant. A positive rate will be a product because products appear over time. The final time should have more product than the initial time. And that's kind of a cool thing to think about in the back of your mind. Here's an example of how you can write the rates for this reaction. Now this is dinitrogen tetroxide going to two nitrogen dioxides. And the rates here uh, can be written in two different ways. First of all, on the left-hand side, you see there's this weird negative, uh, and then there's a delta N2O4 and a delta T on the side. That would be a reaction reaction rate for a reactant, okay? And we know it's a reactant because it has a negative sign in front of it. If we didn't have that negative sign, the change in N2O4, final minus initial, that would be negative. So like you can imagine that um, this part right here, the delta N2O4, that would be a negative quantity. So we put a negative in front of reactants just to make the overall rate positive. I think people like having positive numbers, honestly, better than negative numbers. Um, in the denominator, you have delta time. T 
Temperature is usually capital T and time is usually small t. So again, like all deltas, it's final minus initial. So delta time would be the final time minus initial time. Cool. But what if it's easier to study the reaction rate for a product? All right, no problem. Well, in this case, you can probably imagine the part I'm kind of putting in big square brackets right here. You can probably imagine that the change of the NO2 product over delta T would be awesome. We'd put a positive sign in front of it to keep everything positive. But notice that one half factor, okay? Because NO2 is appearing twice as fast as N2O4 is disappearing. And that comes from the two to one, like two NO2s are appearing for every one N2O4 that's disappearing. So another thing you have to do when it comes to reactant rates in kinetics is you have to go one over the stoichiometry. Now notice for N2O4, there was no one over one because that's just one, all right? But if you have a different stoichiometry, two, three, four, or whatever, then go one over that value. So there's a one half over the delta NO2 over delta time. If you do these two things, if you put a negative sign in front of the reactant rate and you go one over the stoichiometry, then chemists, scientists, and you too can describe the rate of the reaction from either a reactant or a product's perspective. All right, it doesn't matter. And this is really cool because you're lab maybe has the technology to study the N2O4 decreasing over time. So that would be like finding a rate of a reactant. And maybe my lab has a technology to study the NO2 appearing over delta time. That would be the rate of the product. We can compare our answers if, again, you put a negative in front of the reactants and you go one over stoichiometry. This is kind of a cool thing, but it's a lot different than in our real world. Like, um, here's an example. Let's say I said, hey, um, how fast did you drive up to Hood River yesterday? And assuming you did go up to Hood River, okay. Well, you'd probably say it was so many miles per hour. That would be the change of miles. So you started at zero and went to about 60, we'll say, so 60, over maybe an hour. So one hour minus zero, that would be like your speed, okay. But in chemistry, there is, you can talk about the speed from, both directions. You can think about it as uh, arriving uh, f uh, at Hood River from Gresham, or you can talk about it as going from Gresham to Hood River. And in chemistry, you can do this for reactants or products. Again, as long as A, you put a negative in front of the reactants to make all the numbers positive, and B, you go one over the stoichiometry. Here's another example of what we just talked about. In this reaction, N2 and O2 are combining to make NO. So notice two things. First of all, we have two reactants, N2 and O2, and we have one product, NO. And NO, the product, has a two factor in front of it. So what you can do is for the reactants, you can definitely, and there's just a stoichiometry of one, you can just say, hey, no problem, rate equals negative because it's a reaction reactant, delta, final minus initial, N2, over the change in time. And on the right-hand side, you can see what that means. It would be the N2 final minus N2 initial, T final minus T initial, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can do the same thing for the O2, all right? It's another reactant, so it would be delta O2 over delta time, and you can see that. However, if you wanted to relate this to the NO over delta time, you can do so. One over the stoichiometry would be one half delta NO over delta T. And notice we didn't put a, a negative in front because NO is a product. So the reaction rate for this reaction, we can talk about it as the N2 disappearing, we can talk about it as the O2 disappearing, or you can talk about it as the NO appearing. And all of those ways are ways that we can get the speed of the reaction, which is a pretty powerful thing because often, again, Again, it'll be easier to, to study the reactant disappearing or the product appearing, and it doesn't matter. As long as you translate the numbers by putting negatives in front of reactants and one over the stoichiometries, you're good to go. 
Here's another example of how this process works. Um, this is a reaction where you've got some blue dye, and if you add bleach to it, it will actually take the color of the blue dye out, so it gets like clear. And there's a graph down there, and dye, we're assuming, is just a, a single stoichiometry of one. It's a reactant, so we're gonna have negative delta dye over delta time, all right? And again, it's a reactant, so it's negative. We're gonna assume it's the only thing so it's a stoichiometry of one. Now, instead of having uh, final minus initial, you can see there's some actual numbers in there. And uh, we'll talk about this. This comes from the graph. So at the end, the final die concentration, 2.00 times 10 to the minus six, while the initial concentration was 3.4 times 10 to the minus six. So you can see just the part in parentheses right there. Initially, that would be a negative number, but there's a negative in front because dye is a reactant, so it'll end up being positive. And this is the change over one minute. So delta time would be one minus zero or one minute. So this is a way to actually calculate the rate. And that 1.40 times 10 to the minus six, mol it's molarity per minute, basically. That's like a speed, all right? That is a speed in chemistry. So unlike a car, which goes miles per hour or a kilometers per hour if you're in a cool metric country, <laughs> all right? These kind of speeds are usually going to be things like molarity per minute, which is what that is. Sometimes you'll have moles per minute. Um, there's different things like that, but it's always some kind of chemical quantity per unit time. And in this problem, because these are all concentrations in moles per liter, the speed will be molarity per minute, all right? Molarity, remember, is moles per liter. So when the little blue text there, they re just rewrote molarity as moles per liter per minute. The liters and minutes are both in the denominator. Blue dye oxidized with bleach concentration of the blue dye is going down. Each of those red dots on the graph is a value of the dye over time and you can see they're constantly getting smaller. Pouring bleach into a beaker of water and blue food dye converts the dye molecules into a colorless form. The timer indicates the progression of the reaction. If we plot the concentration of dye molecules at various times over the course of the reaction, we can determine the rate of the reaction. So in this problem, they had a timer, and then every minute, they essentially took a sample out, analyzed it, they did this for a couple of minutes to get those values right there. You can actually then find the rate, like how fast things go by a plot like this, and it's pretty cool. A um, couple of things about the plot. So remember, this is a reactant, and reactant concentrations are decreasing, like we talked about. But notice how it doesn't just automatically go down to zero, and that's going to be something else we'll talk about later uh, coming up. There are lots of different rates that are possible in kinetics, all right? And I just want to show this graph as a list of some of the possibilities you can get. Now, what we're going to do most of the time in Chemistry 222 and Chem 223 is what's called an average rate, all right? And it's the average rate. You look at uh, some small value, you take the change in the reactant concentration over the change in time, and you're good to go, all right? And that's what the um, top one is right there. So we're gonna look at speeds that are like 0 0.0080 molarity per minute, stuff like that. However, you can also have what's called an instantaneous rate. This is closer now along with calculus. If this sounds familiar, you should. Um, an instantaneous rate would be like the rate of that one point right there. And in an instantaneous rate, you can actually find that the speed of the reaction is decreasing and stuff, which is totally fine. And you can also have then just an overall rate of reaction, which is usually over a longer time. All right. All of these are valid, and there's uses for all these types of rates. We're usually just going to look at the average rate. However, um, kinetics uh, and calculus do go well together, but you don't have to have any calculus for this class, so don't don't worry. It's okay, man. But anyway, uh, in calculus, uh, you'll learn some more techniques, and in uh, a third-year chemistry course called physical chemistry, you might look at these other kind of rates in more details, and there's lots of neat things you can do 
with them, but it's more than we need for Chem 222. So just realize most of the time we're just going to look at kind of an average rate over a specific time. So here's the kind of question you might see. Uh, it says, what is the average rate of this reaction over the first two minutes? Okay, and there's all these different numbers there. So the time axis is usually the X axis. And what it's saying is it wants to know uh, what is the rate between these points, like where the reaction starts at T equals zero and where it ends at T equals two, which where it ends for this problem, all right? And what you want to do is you're going to have a delta reactant concentration over delta time. Uh, you want to make sure you put a negative in front of these values. Otherwise, you'll end up with a negative value. Um, so on the top part, all right, final minus initial. And final is the time at two minutes. And that's going to be this value right here. So if you go over here, I don't know, maybe this is 1.7, 1.75, something like that. And from 1.7, uh, we would subtract uh, the value up there. So I don't know, that looks like it's not quite 3.5, maybe 3.4. So tentatively, I would say, okay, uh, this must be then 1.7 zero minus 3.40. That's the change in the concentration. It doesn't say what chemical it is. doesn't really matter. That's the 1.7 minus 3.0. And again, I just read the values from the graph and I may not have read them very well. These are always uh, susceptible to the doubtful digit, all that kind of stuff. Um, the bottom part final time minus initial time. Well, the first two minutes, the, initial, the final time would be two minutes. And there we go. And the initial time would be zero. And that would be the delta T part of the rate. Now, initially 1.7 minus 3.0 would give us a negative number. So because this is a reactant, I need to put a negative sign in front of it. So if you do all of this, and again, uh, we'll see what kind of answers I did actually in this calculation. Aha, I came out to be 0.85 moles per liter per minute. So you can see how 1.7 minus 3.4 is actually initially negative 1.7, but we make it positive because it's a reactant rate and reactants get a negative sign to make them positive. And then in the denominator, it was 2 minus 0. So 1.7 7 divided by 2 is where the 0.85 number came from. And this 0.85 moles per liter per minute or 0.85 molar per minute, that's the speed of this reaction. And that's pretty cool. Now, technically, it's just the speed of the first two minutes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's lots of other types of ways to analyze speed, but this is how you would calculate it, all right? You would have these values, these concentrations or amount values over different times, do the difference between the the concentrations in the numerator, difference in time in the denominator, calculate it, good to go. There's lots of factors that affect how fast a reaction goes, or lots of factors that affect the rate. And those include concentration. So the more reactant you have, sometimes that'll make a big difference in how fast things go. The temperature absolutely makes a big difference. Hotter temperatures usually make reactions go faster. The surface area can be a big deal. If the substance is very dense, a lot of times the reaction will only happen on the surface of the substance. So if you have a lot of surface area, you will have more um, reactions. And finally, a catalyst is something that speeds up a reaction, but it doesn't actually participate in the chemistry. It's actually regenerated at the end of the reaction. Catalysts will make reactions go faster. Catalysts are pretty cool. We'll talk about all of these as we go through this um, section. In the test tubes is hydrochloric acid. On the left is a 0.3 molar solution. And on the right, is a 6 molar solution. If we place a strip of magnesium metal in the 0.3 molar solution, the metal begins to react slowly. If we place a similar magnesium strip in the 6 molar solution, the reaction is much more vigorous.
Within moments, the reaction is complete. Meanwhile, most of the magnesium in the 0.3 molar solution is still in solid form. You can see here that the 6 molar HCl doesn't mess around, man. It reacts super fast with that magnesium. And assuming the two pieces of magnesium were the same mass, and it looked like they were, then, oh wow, yeah, 6 molar HCl reacts a lot faster than the 0.3 molar HCl. So this is just an example as telling you that the concentration does make a big difference. I've seen this in the lab. Um, for a while, I tried to use like 0.1 molar HCl with some zinc, and it worked okay. But then I thought, ah, I'll put in some six molar and man, that thing shot off and stuff splattered around. And I was glad I had my safety goggles on. But anyway, needless to say, yeah, rates can make can be definitely influenced by the concentration. So 0.3 went relatively slow and six molar went super fast. Now those graphs on the right hand side would show uh, graphically what this means. You can see the 0.3 molar graph. It's definitely like stretched out better. Like you can see, there's a value all the way down to 400 seconds. On the other hand, the 6 molar HCl and the same axis, wow, it was done in like 10, 15 seconds. So you can see it's very, very steep. So the molarity of the HCl does make a big difference how fast this reaction goes. On the plate is a pile of lycopodium powder. If we aim a flame at it, not much happens. If, however, we take some of the lycopodium and then spray it into a flame, the combustion reaction is explosive. The more surface area of the lycopodium particles that is exposed to oxygen, the faster the reaction. Lycopodium powder comes from a type of a mushroom, apparently, and it's very th dense, very thick, all right? And when you try to put the flame on it directly, not a lot happens because it's so thick, you just have reactions happening on the surface of the lycopodium powder. So, but the difference here is that if you spray it through the flame, oh man, now you've got individual little particles of lycopodium. They all react very quickly in what's essentially a combustion reaction to make some pretty cool things. Um, sometimes magicians will use like a podium power to make like a uh, little flashbang kind of things in their demonstrations. Uh, it can be pretty cool if you know, of course, what you're doing. But um, this is uh, more importantly here, it shows how the surface area uh, can make a big difference. Sometimes if you try to react a raw piece of metal, it's very slow because the metal also like the like a podium powder is very thick. But if you can get the little metal into little tiny pieces or fragments or splinters, then it usually reacts a lot more quickly. Quickly. Hydrogen peroxide in water decomposes slowly at room temperature. In the presence of manganese dioxide, however, the decomposition occurs much more rapidly. The reaction produces oxygen and water. The manganese dioxide is not consumed or otherwise altered by the reaction. It serves only as a catalyst and makes the reaction occur more rapidly. This is a video uh, I showed back in Chem 221 when we were talking about stoichiometry. And I just kind of talked uh, very fast about a catalyst. But a catalyst can be super useful uh, for humans in many, many ways. Um, this is an example of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And hydrogen peroxide, if you buy it at the store, is always uh, sold to you usually in a brown bottle. And it says, keep in the refrigerator, OK? The brown bottle is to keep the air, the sunlight out, because it will make it decompose and the cold um, of the refrigerator just makes it react slowly. However, if you want the reaction to go fast, you can add a little MnO2, manganese 4 oxide, thank you, not manganese dioxide, if you remember the nomenclature lab. But anyway, the manganese 4 dioxide acts as a catalyst, so it makes the transformation of H2O2 into water and oxygen occur much more rapidly. The neat thing about a catalyst is that at the end, where you'd have just oxygen gas and probably water left in the flask, you could evaporate off the water or filter it, whatever, and reuse the MnO2. Catalysts do not participate uh, in an absolute sense in the chemistry. They'll make something happen, but they will be regenerated at the end. So you could have the MnO2 go through many more transformations. If you took Chem 221 at Mount Hood Community College, we, or even Chem 151 sometimes, there's a percent potassium chlorate 
lab. And in that lab, we also used MnO2 to make the decomposition of the KClO3 occur a little bit faster. Um, MnO2 is a relatively inexpensive catalyst, which is nice, so we can use it. If it was expensive, we would absolutely be recovering it, recycling it, reusing it again, stuff like that. So to summarize, a catalyst just makes a reaction go faster, but it's not involved, it's not used up in the reaction. So you can reuse the catalyst sometimes over and over and over for many tens of thousands of transitions. If we pour equal amounts of hot and room temperature bleach into separate beakers of colored water, we see that the hot bleach on the left destroys dye molecules more rapidly than the room temperature bleach on the right. Temperature definitely affects how fast a reaction will go. Um, warm temperatures tend to make reactions go faster. Cold temperatures tend to make reactions go slower. And I feel this way myself when I go out on a cold day. I'm just not quite as enthused, ready to rock and roll. On the other hand, on a nice warm day, I'm like, yes, the sun is out. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling more excited. I think I react faster. So, you know, chemical reactions are like your weird instructor, basically. But uh, hopefully you get the idea. We'll talk about why temperature makes such a big difference uh, in this chapter. When you want to start thinking about reaction rates and stuff like that, um, you can't help but think about the mechanism. Like, why uh, do some chemicals make the reaction go faster? All right, and why is temperature a big deal? Stuff like that. So, in order to figure out the mechanism, which is really how reactants go to products, we need to think about the reaction rate. All right, like what makes things go fast and slow, and we also need to think about that concentration dependence. Some chemicals make the reactions go a lot faster if you increase their concentration, but some don't. And the question is like, why? And that's all stuff we're going to study in this section. Here's an example where it's a compound called cisplatinum, all right? And cisplatinum is a platinum center. So on the left-hand side here, this kind of silver atom, that's the platinum. And the chlorines there are the kind of gold atoms. And they call it cis, kind of like a cis in a double bond in organic chemistry. In inorganic chemistry, as we'll see in Chem 223, a lot of times cis just means 90 degrees on the central atom trans would be 180 degrees across the central metal atom. But anyway, neither here nor there. Cisplatinum is somewhat reactive. It'll react with water. One of the chlorides is pushed out, you can see on the product side, and water then bonds to the platinum center. So let's say that we wanted to study this reaction. And this is not something academic. Cisplatinum is actually an anti-cancer drug. So maybe we want to figure out the things that make this reaction faster, slower, keep the reactants uh, pure for a longer time. Well, what we'd have to know is we have to study the rate of change of the compound. Like how fast is this reaction occurring? So we'd want to know the amount of the cisplatinum that's reacting, the moles per liter, divided by the elapsed time. And we'd probably put a negative sign in front of it, of course, because this is a reactant, all that kind of stuff. Let's say that we have a rate for the reaction, which is 4.3 times 10 to the minus 6 molar per second, all right? And what that means is that every second, you're going to use up 4.3 times 10 to the minus 6 moles per liter. Then let's say that we want to know how long it's going to take for a 0 0.00250 molar solution to react, all right? Well, if you look at those units, you've got a molar per second second and a molar. So it shouldn't be too hard to figure out the time for the cisplatinum to react. So rate moles per molar per second equals molars, the cisplatinum concentration we're starting with, divided by the time elapsed. And in a problem like this, where we want to see about how long it takes, we want to solve for time. So in this problem, you take the concentration you start with and you divide it by the rate all right. And there's lots of rates like I saw and you could saw, see the rates change. But overall, if you want a rough guide as to how long it's going to take, concentration divided by the rate, make sure molar divided by molar cancels out. One over second on the bottom becomes second on the top. This reaction is going to take 581 seconds roughly 
to be done. All right. And that's really cool. In my graduate work in graduate school in chemistry, I used to do some reactions that took a long time, but long time meant multiple hours, but how many hours? All right. And when Friday night rolls around, uh, maybe I didn't want to be in the lab looking at my reactants reacting. Maybe I wanted to uh, (coughs) go to the library and uh, (coughs) study, uh, study journals. Actually, what that means is go with my friends on Friday. I love to watch movies, long story. Anyway, so um, using a process like this, if you have a reaction rate and you know approximately how much of the chemical you're putting in, you can solve for a rough time. And when I did this in my world, I saw it was like 10 hours, all right? So what I would do is go out with my friends to the movies or study journal articles, whatever, for say maybe eight hours, come back a little bit early because you're never only sure if you got the right values and stuff, uh, you can then find out uh, what's going on. Now, the rate of the reaction is proportional to the amount of the reactant you start with. So you add more reactant, it's going to take longer, stuff like that, and that seems reasonable. So what you can do then is you can express this as a rate law, all right? And this is kind of an important part. This is the first big topic here we're going to look at in this section. And in a rate law, the rate always equals the rate constant K times the reactant concentration. And there may be something up there in the upper right corner, which we're going to call an order of reaction. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The first thing, though, is that the rate is like finding out what makes a reaction go faster or slower, because the rate, again, is like the speed. And the speed equals rate constant K times the reactants you've got. That little K is going to be important to us. K, the rate constant, is independent of concentration. So you can have as much cisplatinum or as little cisplatinum as you want, not going to affect K. But it does change with temperature. So we'll talk about K uh, in a later lecture a little bit more. But for right now, just realize K is kind of like a holy grail when you want to find out the things that make reactions go faster or slower. If you have the rate constant, you have a lot of power over a given chemical reaction. Let's talk about some generic reactions. Let's take big A and it's going to react with big B to make X, big X. And little a, little b, and little x, those are stoichiometries, all right? So it could be like one magnesium and two HCLs making some kind of products, all right? A, b, and x, the little ones are just the stoichiometry. There's also in this reaction going to be a catalyst C. So what people do sometimes is they'll write a generic rate law. And that's what this line is right here. So we saw in the last slide that rate equals K times, in that case, cisplatinum. Well, for this reaction, we would write rate equals K times the concentration of big A to the M power, and then big B to the N power, and big C to the P power. Now, in the last example, little M was 1, and big A would be that cisplatinum compound. We didn't have B or C, and that's totally fine, but if we did have B and C, we could put them in. We didn't talk about, in the last problem, about the MNs and Ps, but they are important. Those little exponents are called the reaction orders. We're going to see that some reactants and or catalysts are more important to the speed than others, okay? So the values of MN and P are going to be really important to us. In Chem 222 and Chem 223, the reaction orders will be 0, 1, or 2 only. All right, and I'm going to highlight that because that's really important. Reaction orders M, N, and P in that generic expression will be 0, 1, or 2 only. All right, after Chem 223, you might see other kinds of orders, and that's fantastic. But in our classes, 0, 1, or 2 only.
You have to get the zero, one, or two reaction orders through experiment. There's no way to do it mathematically, all right, theoretically. You have to sit down in the lab, and I'll show you some examples of that in order to find zero, one, and two. For cisplatinum, then, the order was one, all right? There was like an invisible one in the order right there. But you'll see that there's zeros, ones, and sometimes twos in these reactions, and they can have a big effect on how fast the reaction goes. The overall order for a reaction is the sum of the reaction orders, the individual reaction orders. So if there really are two reactants and a catalyst all affecting the reaction rate, then the overall order would be just M plus N plus P. All right, you add them up. This isn't a super big deal, but it is something you run into once in a while. Most of the time, we're going to be really focused in on trying to find the reaction orders first. And again, those will be zeros, ones, or twos only. And once you have those, then you can figure out what the rate constant K is. The K is kind of like the holy grail here. If you have a little m, an order of reaction equal to one, chemists would refer to this as a first order reaction. So if your, re if your reaction rate law is rate equals k times a to the first power, we would say that this reaction is first order in a and first order overall because one plus zero plus zero, all the rest of them is just one, no problem. First order is by far the most common kind of order. And if you double the amount of A, you will double the amount, the speed of the reaction because A to the first would be two to the first power. Anything to the first power is just itself. So two to the one is two. So if A doubles, the rate will double. If A triples, three to the first would be three, then the rate would go up by a factor of three. On the other hand, if you have the concentration of A, so you go from like 0.5 molar to 0.25 molar, then it would be like one half to the first power. Your rate would go down by two. So sometimes if you have a first order reactant and you, oh, I ran out of chemicals, so I only have half as much, your reaction will actually go half as slow. And we'll talk about that more later. Rate order of one is very common. You can have, though, an M value equals to two, all right? And in this case, we would call A a second order reactant. Now, anything to the second power is going to have a different value, a different effect on the rate than the first power was. So let's say that we have a one molar A solution, and then we double A to two moles per liter. Well, if A has doubled, two squared is four, your rate is going to go up by four times. And if you were to triple A, three squared is nine, your rate would go up nine times. Also, if you cut your concentration of A in half, one half squared is one fourth, your speed will go down to one fourth of what it was. Second order reactants are not as common as first order or zero order. But man, if you have a second order reactant, the reaction will just have crazy speed changes. You'll change things just a little bit and all of a sudden the speed, the rate goes up by so much or down for that matter. Uh, you'll note, you'll see one if you have one. But another kind of common order for a reaction is if you have a zero. Now in math, anything to the zero power is one, all right? And there are a lot of examples of zero order reactants out there. If you double A and A is a zero order reactant, A two to the zero is just one. So if your A doubles, there's no effect on the rate. If you have A, one one half to zero is also one. No effect on the rate. Rate stays the same. You double A, two to the zero is one. You triple A, three to the zero is one. Do anything you want to that concentration. It's not going to affect the rate. So you're going to see here, zero order, first order, second order. Um, zero order and first order are by far more common than second order, but we'll see some second orders too. And all of them have a different effect on how fast the reaction will go or what the rate of the reaction is. 
Let's look at an example. In this reaction, we're taking um, an aldehyde, it's ethanol. Ethanol is CH3CHO. Ethanol breaks down into methane, CH4, and carbon monoxide. And so let's say we do a study of this reaction and we're studying the amount of ethanol that we start with and then we're figuring out the rate of disappearance of ethanol. So let's talk about this. We're going to do multiple experiments. This is the amount of the reactant ethanol we're starting from, starting with. And over here, this number, this is the rate, all right? It's moles per liter per second or molarity per second. So that's the speed. So notice here that at 0 0.10 moles per liter, our rate, the disappearance thing over there, 0 0.020 molarity per second. Well, in our second experiment, we double the ethanol. We go from 0 0.10 to 0 0.20, all right? So notice that going from 0 0.10 to 0 0.20, we're doubling the ethanol, all right? I.e. 0 0.20 divided by 0 0.10 is 2, all right? When I said earlier about doubling, there was a reason for that, because here we're doubling the ethanol. Now, look at the difference in the rates on the right side. 0 0.081 is quite a bit different than 0 0.020. If ethanol would have been a first-order reactant, then we would have went from 0 0.020 to 0 0.040. Doubling in a first order makes a doubling of the reaction rate. And if the ethanol would have been a zero order reactant, then doubling ethanol, we would have still had a number for the disappearance, which was about 0 0.020. To zero wouldn't have changed at all. However, in this case, doubling ethanol t made a quite a ch different change in the rate. It went from about 0 0.08 to 0 0.02. That's a factor of four. So the difference here to the difference between these two, about four. And remember that the ethanol right here, it's got a factor. We're trying to see what this factor is. 2 to the x equals 4. What do you think x is going to be? And remember, in our classes, x is only going to be 0, 1, or 2. If you said x is probably going to be 2, pat yourself on the back. We'll see how why to get that. If you didn't get 2, hang tight here a little bit. Let me keep going. All right, so this scientist decided to get some more data. So they got uh, experiment number three, where they went to 0 0.30 moles per liter, the rate now 0.182, so you can see it's going up even more. And finally, uh, experiment number four, they had 0.40 they went up to 0.318 moles per liter. Now, what we're trying to do here is we want to find the rate law. And the first step here is to do a set of experiments like we've just done. You're changing the concentration of one of the reactants, in this case, the only reactant. And we're going to use differences between two of the trials and compare them to the rate to see what those values of x is. So when I did the 2 to the x equals 4, again, the 2 part came from 0 0.20 divided by 0 0.10, and the 4 is about approximately equal to 0 0.081 divided by 0 0.020. So in this problem that we're looking at right here, we're trying to figure out the components of rate equals K times the one reactant, ethanol, CH3CHO, to the X. And when you want to solve for a rate law, the first thing you've got to figure out is the X, that order of reaction. So you can compare any two trials where the ethanol changes, but the other reactants, or if there are any, um, stay the same. Now in this reaction, it's pretty easy. We have only one reactant. So let's compare number two and number one, because we're doubling the ethanol, and we're going to look at the change in the concentration uh, relative to the change of the reaction rate. If you look here at this part, rate equals K times ethanol to the X. So for trial number two, the rate is the 0 0.081. That equals K times the concentration of ethanol in number two, which was 0 0.20 to the X.
We're going to divide that by rate 1. So rate 1 was 0 0.020 on the bottom, and that equals on the bottom k times the ethanol 0 0.10 to the x. Now, the k's will cancel out here, all right? k's cancel out. So you have 0 0.081 divided by 0 0.020, which is 4.1. I said it was about 4 earlier. 4.1 is even better. And then in the ex exponent world, 0 0.20 to the x divided by 0 0.10 to the x, you can combine that into one big problem to the x. So 0.2 divided by 0.1 is 2, 2 to the x. So 2.0 to the x equals 4.1. And remember, x can only be 0, 1, or 2. So let's go through what would happen if x was 0 first. Well, if x was 0, anything to the 0 power is 1. So if you had there 2.0 equals 1 for rate 2 over rate 1, we'd say that x was 0. But obviously, the rate 2 over rate 1 is not 1, so this is not a 0 order reaction. If x was 1, then 2 to the 1 is 2. So if rate 2 over rate 1 was about 2.0, then we'd say x was a first order reactant. It's not a first order reactant. So let's try if x equals 2. 2.0 to the second power would be 4. Hey, that's looking pretty close there to 4.1. So x equals 2. This is a second order reactant. But wait a minute, Dr. Russell, I don't like that way of thinking about things. That's totally cool. I kind that way, that kind of way, uh, kind of a hand grenade way it works, but it sometimes feels a little bit cheesy. Uh, in the kinetics labs we're going to do, you can also use logarithms to get a better value of x. Now, 4.1 equals 2.0 to the x. In logarithms, you can break that down, add a log, and it can be natural log or base 10 log, but I use base 10. So log log 4.1 equals log 2.0 to the x. And one of the cool things about using logarithms is you can rewrite log 2.0 to the x as x log 2.0. So this is a way to get the x, the exponent by itself. So f log 4.1 equals log two, x log 2.0. You can solve for x. x equals log 4.1 divided by log 2.0 x comes out to be 2. So either way, either by thinking about what happens when x is 0, 1, and 2, which is what I did first, or if you want, you can use logarithms, you should find here that the x value is 2. So we would refer here to ethanol, the CH3CHO, as a second order reactant, all right? We'll talk about more what it means to be second order, but for right now, just realize finding that little exponent, that order of the reaction, super important. And this is what you do. You have to do this through experiment, all right? You can't do this theoretically by any ways known. You have to take several trials and compare them, like we did in this example, to find the order x. Here's a reaction. 2NO plus 2H2 goes to N2 and 2 waters. And it says that the reaction above is second order in NO and third order overall. And it says then what's the rate law for this reaction? Okay, so what we're trying to do here is find rate equals K times NO to the X and H2 to the Y. And it says there that the reaction is second order in in NO. So the NO to the X, that means the little X, the superscript up and to the right of NO will be 2. Now it says also that it's third order overall. So it's second order in NO and the order of NO plus the order of H2 equals 3. That's what the third order overall is. So it probably, you can see then, third order overall minus the second order thing, X, the hydrogen value is going to be 1. H2 is a first order reactant. So for this reaction, you would write rate equals K times NO to the second power times H2 to the first power, or just H2 by itself. Notice that NO was a second order reactant, and that too just happened to be the same as the order with respect to NO. 
On the other hand, the H2 is a second order reactant, or second, it's stoichiometry of two in the reaction, excuse me, but the overall reaction here means that H2 is a first order reaction. So I put this problem up because first of all, it gives me a chance to talk about overall uh, rate orders, which is kind of interesting. But also I wanna point out that the stoichiometries of the reactants and products are often going to be different than the rate orders. So NO here happened to be a rate order of two. But you can see here that hydrogen is not a rate order of two, i.e. answer D is not correct. In this problem, we had to use the idea that uh, the overall order is two. So that means the order here, the answer here is going to be C. So the stoichiometries are not necessarily the same as the reaction orders, and that's pretty important. In the last problem, we saw that the ethanol is a second order reaction. So, so far then we'd write rate equals K times the ethanol to the second power. So the questions then say, all right, the, here the rate goes up by blank when the initial concentration doubles. Well, if the concentration doubles, that means the ethanol, the part in the square bracket, doubles. Two squared, the rate would go up by four times. So this reaction, because there's a little two right there, that means this reaction is second order. Once you have the order of a reaction, you can go back and solve for the last part, the rate constant K. And rate constant K has some really good uses we're going to see. Um, you can use any of the experiments in the previous slide's data. All right, you could use experiment one, two, three, or four. Um, in this example, I used experiment number three. And the rate in experiment three was 0.182. And that equals K, which we don't know yet. And experiment three, the concentration of ethanol was 0.30. And we know now that ethanol is a second order reactant, so 0 0.30 squared. So K here would be 0.182 divided by 0.3 squared. K comes out to be 2.0. You don't have to report any units for K. The units of K are all over the place, and people honestly don't usually report them. But if you are curious about units, in this case, it would be uh, liters per mole seconds. But again, don't lose any sleep over that. Anyway, once you have K, you can calculate the rates of other values of ethanol as long as you don't change the temperature. If you change the temperature, you have to recalculate K. We'll talk about those kind of things later. We need to know what the concentration of a reactant is as a function of time. And a heck of a lot more reactions in the actual world are first order. Um, all radioactive reactions, which we're gonna look at a lot in the next chapter, all of them are first order. All biology reactions that are known anyway are first order. And a lot of chemistry reactions are first order as well. So this is one of those times, I always hate to say this, but if you have to guess, uh, guess first order because there's a lot more first order reactions than anything else. If you have a first order reaction, all right, then rate equals K times the reactant R to the first power. And remembering that rate is the negative because you have to keep them negative because they're uh, reactants. Rates equal negative the change in the reactant concentration over change of time. So instead of writing rate equals K times the concentration of R to the first power, we rewrote here the rate part for what it actually is. It's negative the change of concentration over the change of time. And of course, because the first order reactant, the something to the first power, people usually just ignore it. This is actually kind of helpful, believe it or not. If you integrate this, and this is where calculus comes in, and you don't need to integrate anything in Chem 222 or 223, but if you have seen calculus, or if you will be seeing calculus, it's not too hard to do. Anyway, you integrate this thing, you end up with this expression right here. And this expression with the natural logs, which comes from integration, natural log r over r0 equals minus kt. Now, a couple of things. Ln is the natural log. It's not the base 10 log, L-O-G. So if you're going to do these problems, make sure you use the Ln button and not L-O-G. 
The second thing, R0 there means initial amount of R. So that's like how much R you start with. And then the rest of it, on the top there, you've got just R. That's the amount of R at time little t. So sometimes in some texts, you'll see like a little t right there. It's the amount of R left at time t, and that equals uh, the negative rate constant, where k is the rate constant here. But this, hand, this equation is actually super helpful for scientists. It's called the integrated first order rate law. And if you know the reaction is a first order reactant, and almost everything in chemistry chemistry is, basically everything in biology and nuclear radiation is, then, oh my gosh, you can find out so many cool things. Um, and so we're going to use this expression a lot, all right? And again, it's natural log R over R0 equals minus KT. And there's a lot of neat things you can do with it, and I'll show you some of those here coming up. Sucrose is a type of sugar, and like a lot of sugars, it will break down over time. And the rate of disappearance of sucrose, because it's a biological function, it's first order, so you can write rate equals K times sucrose concentration to the first power, or just rate equals K times sucrose. And someone has already calculated the value of the rate constant K to be 0.21 inverse hours. If you see that inverse hours, you just realize that equals one over hours. All right, it's the same thing. Hours negative one takes maybe a little less time to write than one over hours. But anyway, I digress. So let's say that you have a sucrose concentration of 0 0.010 moles per liter, and you want to know how long it's going to take to drop to 90% of the initial value. So how long is it going to take to go to 0 0.0010 molar? Well, well, if it's fast, you don't mind waiting around, but if this is slow, you might want to go do other things, all right? Uh, you might want to go study journal articles in the library or, or go see a movie or whatever kind of things you might want to do. This is actually a way that you can figure this stuff out using that first order integrated rate law. There's all the data at the top. We're going to use that first order integrated rate law, which was natural log R over R0 equals minus KT. Now, the amount we started with, R0, 0 0.010 molar, and that goes in the bottom. The amount we have left, i.e. R at time T, 0 0.0010 molar. So R over R0, how much we have left divided by how much we started with. And that equals minus kt. So k is that 0.21 inverse hours, and we basically want to solve for t, how long it's going to take. Now, a couple of things. When you're doing the natural log r over r0, r and r0 have to be the same kind of units. They have to cancel out. So you have to convert one into the other if you don't have the same kind of unit. Here we have two molarities, so it's no problem. The other thing is that k and t are both going to be positive numbers, okay? All the time. No negative Ks, no negative Ts. At least not in this class anyway. Um, so if you do end up with something negative, it probably means you forgot that little minus and the minus KT. And then finally, the units of K and T must be the same kind of unit. Now K will be inverse time, like here it's inverse hours. And in this problem, the T, the time elapsed, is going to be regular hours. So you wouldn't want to use like inverse hours and seconds, all right? You'd have to convert seconds into hours or inverse hours into inverse seconds. They have to be the same kind of unit. But anyway, this is a good time to do this problem on your own and see if you get the right answer. Make sure that you use the natural log and not the base 10 LOG log. So natural log 0 0.0010 divided by 0 0.010, that comes out to be natural log of 0 0.100. And if you put that in your calculator, that comes out to be minus 2.3. So natural log 0 0.0010 divided by 0 0.010, negative 2.3. And that equals negative kt, k 
k is 0.21. Time is what we're solving for here. So time is going to equal negative 2.3 divided by negative 0.21. The negatives will cancel. We'll have a positive value, which I said earlier was so important, etc., etc. This value here comes down to be 11 hours. So your sucrose will go down to 90% in 11 hours. I would come back within, say, 9, 10 hours just to make sure you're still on target. You never can tell about science, always some flexibility, but this is a way to estimate uh, pretty well how long reactions are going to take. For the reaction, A going to B, the disappearance of A is first order when K equals 0 0.030 inverse minutes. If we begin with a concentration of A of 0.36 moles per liter, what will the concentration of A be after 46 minutes? Okay, so let's think about what we've got here. So first of all, this is natural, the integrated first order rate law, natural log R over R0 equals minus kt okay so r0 is the 0.36 moles per liter number we don't know r how much is going to be left after 46 minutes but we do know that k 0 0.030 inverse minutes and the time elapsed 46 minutes the times are in the same kind of unit inverse minutes and minutes so that's no problem remembering that there's a negative sign in there the concentration will come out to be a positive number now, uh, it will not be zero. All right, answer E. That doesn't make any sense, but the other ones, honestly, you just kind of have to put into the math problem and figure out what it is. So when I did this, I got a value of 0 0.091 moles per liter. And you can see there uh, what exactly I did. I started off by taking natural log R over R0 equals minus KT. And like we talked about, R0 0.36, K 0 0.030, time 46. And at that point, you just got to kind of get rid of everything. Now, if you haven't done a lot with logarithms, you've got to get rid of the logarithms. This little E thing right here, E is called the anti-natural log. And you've got to get rid of the natural log there in order to make sense of all this. So we're going to take the anti-natural log of both sides. Usually on the calculator, you'll have an LNX button or something like that. And then usually second function LN is says this little EX, E to the X. And that's the anti-natural log. You don't have to worry about the math part of it. Just plug and chug this stuff. So what you want to realize is that E raised to the natural log, these two will cancel each other out. But on the other side, you do have to go E power negative uh, 0 0.030 times 4 times 46. If you get an answer of 0.25 to 3 sig figs, you've done it right. All right. If you haven't gotten that answer, please take a screenshot of it or a picture with your phone, whatever. Send it to me. Let me see if I can help you out with this problem because this stuff can, it's not hard. It's all plug and chug, but it can be a little bit weird. Anyway, the E and the natural log on the left cancel. So you have R over 0.36 equals 0.252. And then R itself is just 0.36 six times 0.252, that's where the 0.091 number came from. So this is the kind of problem you'll see in this section. Nothing you can't handle, but make sure you can do this problem before you move on. The integrated rate law suggests a way to tell if the reaction is first order based solely on experiment. So here's another reaction. Uh, dinitrogen pentaoxide is kind of unstable. It breaks down into NO2 and O2. And the rate here equals K times N2O5. So this is a first order reaction. All right, somebody has figured that out. Well, let's say we do this reaction and we're taking the concentrations of N2O5 at different times. So 0, 1, 2, and 5, there's the concentrations of N2O5. And you can see it's decreasing because it's a reactant, it's going down. Now, for reasons that'll be clear on the next page, 
I'm taking the natural log of those numbers. So natural log of one is zero, natural log 0 0.705 is negative 0.35, et cetera, et cetera. I'll show you why I'm doing that, but that's something we're gonna do in this section. So if you do need natural log of those numbers, just natural log 0.173, that comes out to be negative 1.75, et cetera, et cetera. If you plot the concentration of N2O5 versus time, it doesn't come out to be very straight. And hopefully you can kind of see here that the N2O5 is kind of curving. And scientists really like to have straight lines because straight lines mean you can do like equations, all right? Curved lines, you could do equations too, but you'd need to do powers or exponential analysis, stuff like that. However, if you plot the natural log of the concentration versus time, you get a really nice straight line. So notice here that just plotting concentration in 205 versus time really didn't do that much. But natural log in 205 versus time, we get a nice straight line. And if you think about our discussion so far, this may not seem totally out of control because natural log r over r0 equals minus kt can be broken down. Now in the logarithm world, natural log r over r0, you can rewrite as natural log r minus natural log r0. So to get to the expression right here, we took the natural log r over r0, which is natural log n205 divided by natural log n2050, and we first wrote it as natural log r minus natural log r0. We then added natural log r0 to both sides, and lo and behold, natural log n205 equals negative kt plus natural log n205 at zero, and you're like, Russell, you've lost it. This isn't any easier than it was before. Oh, yes it is because you have the equation for a straight line. Your y-axis is this whole thing right here, the natural log of N205. The x-axis is the time. So the slope is going to be equal to negative k. Your slope will be negative. You take the positive version of that negative slope, that's going to be your k. But also really cool, the y-intercept is going to be related to the amount of reactant you started with. So if you do a linear regression on this data, linear regressions automatically generate slopes and y-intercepts for you. Slope equals negative k, so negative slope equals k. This is the coolest way to find rate constants, hands down. And also, we're going to see, sometimes it's difficult to figure out the amount of reactant you started with. Well, if you do natural log constant concentration versus time, y-intercept equals natural log N205. So you take the anti-log of both sides, that's going to give you the initial concentration. All first order reactants will obey this kind of behavior. So all those first order reactions, if you plot the natural log of the reactant concentration versus time, you should get a straight line. And the straight line slope is related to K, and the straight line Y-intercept is related to the amount you started with. So you can actually confirm or figure out how much you started with. You can get the rate constant K. Oh man, that's pretty cool. Second order reactants can also be analyzed in this kind of function. You plot one over the concentration versus time. If you look at the handout, there's a kinetics handout in the companion or online. It will give you the exact values. I will mention them here a little bit in the future. But because first order is so common, that's why I want to really push this. Natural log of the reactant concentration versus time will give you a straight line. That's going to be related to the rate constant k and the amount of reactant you started with and this is what linear regression is super useful for when it comes to chemistry you plug kinetic data in the linear regression gives you the slope and the y-intercept out you are good to go 
This picture right here, uh, especially right here, shows the different kinds of rate orders. And we just went through the one that was the most common, which was the first order reactant. And if you go over there to the more right side, natural log of R versus time T is going to give you a straight line. Slope equals negative K, et cetera, et cetera. Now, for zero order reactants, if you plotted the concentration versus time, you're going to get a straight line, slope equals negative k. On the other hand, for second order reactants, you have to plot, as I mentioned in the last slide, one over the concentration versus time. You will get a straight line, the slope equals positive k there. And again, all the y-intercepts are equal or related to, excuse me, to the r0, the amount of uh, material you started with. Um, you can also, again, see this kinetics cheat sheet, which is in the companion or online for better information about how these all work. The three graphs below were obtained for a chemical reaction, some given chemical reaction. And the question is, what is the order with respect to the rate law for this reaction? And you can see that there's an A versus time, a natural log of A versus time, and one over A versus time, all right? And the one, the answer, the punchline to this question is going to be the one that gives you the straight line. So you can see that one over A versus time is giving you a straight line. The other ones did not. Well, if the one over A versus time is giving you the straight line, that's a test for a second order reaction. So anytime one over A versus time gives you the best straight line, that's going to be second order. If natural log of A versus time would have given you a best straight line, it would have been first order. And if A versus time was the straight line, it would have been zero order. One of those three should fit the reaction if you've done everything right, of course.